from Chicago, it's radio's biggest night. Welcome to the induction ceremonies for the 1998 Radio Hall of Fame. Tonight, the Radio Hall of Fame inducts the king of the radio pruners, Bing Crosby. Top 40 radio legend, Dick Biondi. The voice of the Detroit Tigers, Ernie Harwell. ABC Network disc jockey, Tom Joyner. And Car Talk host, Tom and Ray Maliazzi. We'll also chart the sounds of radio from Bing and Swing to Rock and Chucks. And to present our awards tonight, we have Radio Hall of Famers Susan Stamberg and Chuck Shaden. Brian Lamb of C-SPAN. This cocky Doug Banks. And former Detroit Tigers great Kirk Gibson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our host from AMFM Radio Networks, the first and the king of the countdowns, KC Kasem! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim Bohannon. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to an hour of the magic of radio as we honor six of the magicians who made radio what it was and what it is. Each year, the Radio Hall of Fame inducts broadcasters who've worked either on the air or behind the scenes, people who've made significant contributions to the art and the industry of radio. Tonight, we also celebrate radio's musical history. You'd think from watching Gene's commercials and hearing jump, jive, and wail that swing is the thing today. Well, it is. But it was also the thing back 60 years ago. Tonight we'll cover some American many musical uh, some of America's many musical mood swings, and we'll begin with the most appropriate first inductee. Ah, if only I could have been doing my countdown show when he was having all those hits. I can almost hear myself now. It's the winter of well almost any year since 1942 because our number one song this week has sold a hundred million copies more than any other song in the history of recorded music. But it came about only because the plot of a movie required it. That's right, the film was Holiday Inn, and composer Irving Berlin had to come up with a song for nearly every holiday of the year. When it came to Christmas, this is the tune Mr. Berlin wrote. song for Harry Lillis Crosby, better known as Bing, who made White Christmas the best-selling single record of all time. Bing Crosby also won an Academy Award, and he did a little radio in his spare time, which brings us to his induction into the Radio Hall of Fame. To do the honors, we have a man who knows all about Bing Crosby's long run on the radio. In fact, he knows all about radio, period. Chuck Shaden is an historian whose heart must be in the shape of a radio dial. For his work in preserving and presenting historic radio, Chuck was inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame back in 1993. Ladies and gentlemen, Chuck Shaden. Bean Crosby, yes indeed, did more than a little radio in his spare time. In 1930, he sang with Gus Arnheim in the orchestra on remote broadcasts from Los Angeles' Coconut Grove. The first program of his own on CBS, 15 Minutes with Bing Crosby, hit the airwaves in 1931, and he was off and running with a radio career that would be the foundation for all his other efforts on record, in movies, and later on television. By 1936, he was starring on the Kraft Music Hall on NBC, and his easygoing style was welcomed by radio listeners from coast to coast. His rapport with guests made everyone feel at ease, including the audience at home. After World War II, during which he made countless broadcasts for the Armed Forces Radio Service, Bing Crosby wanted to record his program in advance to avoid repeat broadcasts because of time zone differences, and also so he could achieve perfection with his music, and perhaps so he could have a little more time to play golf with Bob Hope. But NBC was against transcribed or pre-recorded programs. 
craft, the sponsor agreed, no recording. Audiences won't listen to anything but a live program, they said. CBS, the other network, concurred, by the way. But Bing was insistent. He moved then to the new American Broadcasting Company, which was glad to have the popular crooner in any form, live or on tape. ABC found a sponsor, Philco, maker of radios and phonographs, who had no objection to a transcribed Bing Crosby. He went on the air with Philco Radio Time on ABC in 1946, and most listeners didn't even know that the show was pre-recorded. The program's ratings were as high as ever. Soon after, most major radio stars followed Bing's lead in recording their broadcasts, forever changing the way radio programs would be delivered to the listening public. In 1949, Bing switched to CBS with transcribed programs for Chesterfield and later for General Electric, bringing his special style of music and humor to eager listening audiences through most of the 1950s, even into the 60s. Bing Crosby was a radio superstar for more than a quarter of a century. Day, the Don Lee Station, Los Angeles. Introducing Bing Crosby. Here is the moment you have been waiting for. The delayed appearance of that sensational baritone Bing Crosby, whose singing has made him the favorite of California, to the medium to the motion pictures, the vaudeville stage, and the radio. Just one more chance to prove it you alone I care for. Hollywood, California, the makers of Woodbury's facial soap for the skin you love to touch, present Bing Crosby. Yes, I expected love when first we kissed. Blame it on my youth. The Kraft Music Hall with Bing Crosby, John Scott Trotter and his orchestra, the music maids and Lee, Yuki, the charioteers, and here's Bing Crosby. There'll be a hot sun in the town of Berlin. When the Yanks go marching. This is Ken Carpenter welcoming you to the world premiere of Philco Radio Time, produced and transcribed in Hollywood with John Scott Trotter, his orchestra and chorus, the charioteers, Lena Romai, Skitch Henderson, and starring Bing Crosby. <laughs> well, Bing, here we are in a brand new program with Philco. What kind of show are we going to have? Well, I figure on something effervescent, charming, gay, carefree, bright, sparkling, scintillating, ebullient. Uh, no dull spots, huh? Well, there may be a low tonight. Bob Hope's coming over a little later, and this is a little late for him this time of the evening. But before Trowel Nose gets here, let's have some music, huh? When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. The Radio Hall of Fame is proud to induct Bing Crosby. Accepting the award for the late Bing Crosby is his wife, Catherine Crosby. Thank you so much. The voices on your tape, Chuck, were wonderful to hear. I knew Ken Carpenter, and of course I knew Bob Hope. Uh, he did make funny things on Bing shows all the time. And I see that he got into the Hall of Fame before Bing did. <laughs> Pretty clever of him. I wish Rosie were here tonight. I remember their ro recordings together at her house. She had a studio set up in her house, and they did their 15-minute daily show after Bing and I were married. As a matter of fact, after I had three children, and she had five in about the same amount of time. Very big music went on in that house. I, I think we should also mention Murdo McKenzie, who was Bing's engineer after he got to do tape, and Bill Morrow, his writer, who wrote those daily shows, but was a little slow writing, so sometimes when Bing was reading the script on the air, Bill would pull the page that had the words on it and then slam another one. That made the little sort of stutter step that Bing did occasionally on those broadcasts. They started out in vaudeville, but they brought it to radio. And Bing, you know, was not into accepting awards. He'd have hated my being here for this. 
It really would have. But I found in the basement the other night two huge scrapbooks full of awards that Bing was given from about 1931 or two, which is amazing, popular singer, and of course all those gold records. But I'm here because this is Chicago. It's the city of Sara Lee, which every year sponsors a golf tournament that's called simply the Crosby. So we have that memory, and I'm here to see Tony DeSantis, who let me work in his theater. And Bing came there and was very romantic, as I recall. I love being with you, and we thank you very much for this award. The Radio Hall of Fame returns in a moment with a swinging tribute to, well, to swing music. You know those giant scoreboards at ball games? the Hall of Fame room high atop the Cultural Center Hotel in Chicago. It's the smooth and swinging sounds of the Georgia Francis Orchestra with music for your listening and dancing pleasure. <laughs> That's the way it was 60 years ago when swing first swung. Today, after six decades of dance trends, America is swinging again. The latest renaissance began with young people getting into lounge and exotica music from the past by artists like Arthur Lyman, Esquivel, and Martin Denny. Soon, the road led back to Tony Bennett, who swung his way through an MTV Unplugged concert, to Tom Jones, and to Frank Sinatra, and to fellow Rat Packer, Dean Martin. The load, or the road, led back to the capital of Lounge, Las Vegas, and to movies like Swingers in 1996. In various cities from New York and New Orleans to San Francisco and Los Angeles, appreciators of Art Deco and musicians began digging old jazz, jump, and the blues. New bands began to emerge, like the Royal Crown Review, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, LeVay Smith and her Red Hot Skillet Lickers, <laughs> the Vanguard Aces and the Squirrel Nut Zippers. Wishing well. Kids began learning the jitterbug in various versions of swing. Swing fans young and old packed nightclubs. Radio has responded on alternative rock and college stations and stations that play standards. On the AM or FM band, it's big band all over again. It's only right, though. Swing is on the air since it was radio that gave it its first burst of popularity. <laughs> In 
1932, CBS began broadcasting remotes featuring Glenn Gray and the Casa Lomo Orchestra from the Glen Island Casino and the Roseland Ballroom in New York. By 1935, network radio could propel band leaders like Edward Ellington and Benny Goodman into superstardom. Ellington became the Duke and Goodman the King of Swing by the way of the coast-to-coast -coast show called Let's Dance. Dozens of hotel orchestras joined in. It was a rewarding setup all the way around. You see, radio needed entertainment, and the orchestras, bands, and hotels, not to mention the music publishers, composers, and singers, got valuable exposure. People turned out because they had heard those bands on the radio. One of the pioneer hotel bands swung under the baton of Vincent Lopez in New York City. After one particularly successful remote broadcast, E.M. Statler of the Statler Hotel sold him I couldn't build business up like this in a thousand years of hard work. You did it in an hour. I think radio has some possibilities. Well, it still does. Just ask any of the new generation of swingers. The Brian Setzer Orchestra is on the air with the hit Jump, Jive, and Wail. That's the song you're also hearing on that Jeans commercial. It was popularized by Louis Prima, Louis Prima, more than 30 years ago. On radio, what's old is new again. Our next inductee called himself the ugliest and skinniest disc jockey in the world. <laughs> That's good enough for us. Now to induct him into the Radio Hall of Fame, we have Brian Lamb, a gentleman who grew up listening to Wild Dick Biondi. Contrary to warnings by Brian's parents, Brian did not go crazy. In fact, Brian became a successful journalist, both on the air and in print. And in 1977, he helped form C-SPAN. Please welcome the chairman and CEO of C-SPAN, Brian Lamb. Brian Lamb. It's great to be here and to think back to those nights in my hometown of Lafayette, Indiana, when I listened to my favorite DJ on the Rock of Chicago WLS. Dick Biondi helped introduce rock and roll to a generation of kids, including me. And now to bring him into the Radio Hall of Fame is a thrill. You know, the stereotype of a top 40 DJ went something like this. He was loud, fast talking, full of platter chatter, crazy contests and stunts. He never knew job security, and he was always on the move, bouncing like a bad check from station to station and from town to town. Well, Dick Biondi fits that stereotype, and he's proud of it. <laughs> Loud, his name was, among others, The Screamer. Stunts, at an Elvis Presley concert in the late 50s, he got Elvis to sign an autograph on his T-shirt. Then, instead of putting it into a safe where it would appreciate in value, he jumped into the crowd, which proceeded to tear the shirt into bits. Covered with cuts and scratches, Dick had to go to the hospital. No doubt, the publicity he got for this early version of stage diving helped heal his wounds. Mike Joseph, a radio consultant who worked with him early in his career, says Dick had numerous attributes. His energy, his presentation, his appeal to the younger generation. He sounds and sounded like a rock jock should. Dick even had a hit record of his own, a novelty tune called on top of a pizza, he'll sing the rest. Despite his great successes in Buffalo and Chicago, Dick Biondi, being a DJ, kept on moving to LA's KRLA, to Mutual Broadcasting in 1964, to Chicago's WCFL for a five-year run beginning in 1967. For the year 1972, it was Cincinnati, then to South Carolina for 10 years. He ultimately returned back here in Chicago in 1984 and helped launch the station known as Magic 104, known today as Oldies 103.4. There, Dick Biondi continues to rock and roll. Hello, everybody. Dick Biondi with you on the big KB. Going to be with you until midnight over 17 states in the eastern seaboard and everybody up there in Canada. Good to have you aboard. You'll never believe what happened to me this morning. My boss got on me again, called me in, and he said, Dick, you talk too much, you. It's a good time for the good sound of music with Dick Biondi. Chicago. Hey, Rumble. Hey, Dick Biondi. 
the Nut Nick Biondi. And to start off our show tonight, we have the fabulous Enrico Caruso and the love theme from Traviata. The Dick Biondi Show asking you to be happy and smiling from number one, first and fun, first in music, KRLA. These are the kinks. Who'll be the next in line? Who'll be the next? This is Mutual, the network for young America. Hi, everybody. Friday, January 29th, 1965. The Dick Biondi Show, and I'll tell you what I'd like to hear right now. Good evening, everybody. Hello, Chicago. Dick Beyond at 809, 48 degrees. Saturday night in Chicago and Fire Radio and yours truly, Dick Beyond. Super Gold Rocky Road. Well, it sure is good to be back, isn't it, Mr. Beyond? You bet it is. And here come the Orleans. Good morning, and it's a beautiful day. From the loop, FM 98, I'm Dick Biondi with that great one by the Beatles, Can't Buy Me Love. It's 5.30, and this is Dick Biondi with Chicago's Hot Music on B96. But we got an 80 degree temperature. Doesn't that feel good? Okay, how about Cornelius Brothers? 104.3 tells you how to treat the lady. Oh, my friend. The Radio Hall of Fame is proud to induct the wild Italian Dick Biondi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please allow me, please allow me to say hello to my mother, who is in upstate New York listening to WABC. Mom, thank you for you and Pop and my sister Jerry for allowing me and helping me to follow my dream, which was to become a radio announcer and meet so many wonderful people. I also want to say thanks to my lovely wife, Mary Beth. Uh, thanks to Bob Surratt, who was instrumental in bringing me back here in 1983. Thanks to Harvey Perlman, my present employer, who has the distinction of being the man with the longest record of not having fired me. <laughs> thanks to my program director, Kevin Robinson, to my fellow employees, Scott Miller, John Landecker, Greg Brown, and Pat O'Kelly. And if you don't mind, let me please say hello to Bob Morgan, who on the year they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, allowed me to do my first commercial on the radio in Auburn, New York. To Bob Cullings, the man who spent four years teaching me how to say the instead of the, and three instead of tree. And God rest his soul, the man who took me out of the minor leagues and put me in the major leagues, the wonderful Sam Holman. I want to take a moment to say to any young radio person that's listening tonight, if you're interested in radio, come on in. There's plenty of room, there's plenty of time, but remember two things. Take yourself not seriously. Take the job seriously. And remember, we're not really that important on the radio. What we do is to inform and entertain the people that do the important things. To my fans, thank you for enriching my life, for letting me be a part. God bless all of you. Thank you for all these wonderful years. The Radio Hall of Fame at the Museum of Broadcast Communications is on the web. Be sure to log on to www.mbcnet.org for details of everything the museum has to offer. www.mbcnet.org. The induction ceremonies continue in a moment with the great Detroit baseball broadcaster, Ernie Harwell. Hold that tiger and stay tuned. 
I've been part of hundreds of renovating, building, and rehabbing projects over the years. broadcast of the Radio Hall of Fame Awards in Chicago. Because the Hall of Fame honors those who've excelled behind the scenes as well as on the air, we inducted Ralph Guild earlier this evening. Ralph is the innovative and visionary chairman and CEO of Interrep, the sales organization for radio advertising. Congratulations, Ralph. We now go, we now go to the sports page to induct a broadcaster who's no stranger to Halls of Fame. To tell you about Ernie Harwell, we have one of the all-time great clutch hitters in baseball. He first shined on the diamond as a Detroit Tiger, but he's forever etched in history for the game-winning home run he hit as a Los Angeles Dodger in the 1988 World Series. Here's Radio Hall of Famer Vin Scully making the call. Please welcome Kirk Gibson, everybody. For the baseball fan, there isn't anything much more satisfying than a sunny day at the old ballpark. But in many towns and cities across the country, there's a close runner-up. Listening to the play-by-play -play of the games is described by one of the true masters. Over the years, the great baseball announcers have included such Radio Hall of Fame inductees as Mel Allen, Harry Carey, Jack Rickhouse, Ben Scully, Jack Buck, and Red Barber. Since 1960, for the fans of the Detroit Tigers, number one on that list has been Ernie Harwell. After 50 years in Major League Baseball, and at age 80, he's still going strong, having covered the Tigers this past season on TV Fox Sports Detroit. But all the years, it seems, have been good for Ernie. Born in Georgia, he was writing for the Sporting News while still in high school. At Emory University in Atlanta, he met Lulu, the woman who had become his wife and the mother of their four children. After serving in the Marines in World War II, Ernie became a baseball broadcaster for the minor league Atlanta Crackers. But Ernie wasn't limited to the diamond. He also covered football and several other sports. However, it was his baseball work that earned him devoted fans in Brooklyn, in Baltimore, and most of all in Detroit. In 1988, or 1981, I'm sorry, Ernie was the first active announcer inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's the voice of summer, Bob Talbert wrote in the Detroit Free Press, the thrill of a base hit. He's visual images, a batter watching a third strike, like a house standing beside the road. 
He's the genuine article when it comes to baseball. Ask anyone in the game. Nobody's more the game than Ernie Harwell. Go get him, Tiger. Wow. <laughs> Belt now pitches. Fielder hits a high fly ball to deep right. Sosa going back to the wall, looking, leaping, and it is long gone. A three run homer, the first of the year for Cecil Fielder. And the Tigers have jumped in front, 4 0 here in Chicago. Emotion and the pitch to Kyler. He swings. There's a drive to deep right. Might be. It is gone. A grand series round and six. Three men out for the Tigers. They've got two runs in. They lead it six to three. There'll be joy in time. And the fielder swings. And there's a drive to left. It is hooking. And it is long gone. Big ball for Cecil Fielder. A grand now everybody's ready. Here's the wind up and here's the pitch. He swings and there's a long one to deep left. It might be. It is long gone. Win the game in the ninth inning with a home run. Leading it off and the Tigers take the victory. Go get him, Tiger. Wow. The Radio Hall of Fame is proud to induct. Ernie Harwell. Thank you, Kirk. It is a great uh, blessing from God that he has given me tonight to show a tongue-tied kid from Georgia the way to this Hall of Fame. I have another great blessing, my wife, Lula. We've been married 57 years, but she is still my very best friend. But there, there is another woman in my life. When I was a fifth grader in Atlanta, Georgia, I was tongue-tied. And all the fifth graders in the city of Atlanta were required to either debate or make a speech once a month. You can imagine how embarrassing that might have been for a shy youngster who was sensitive about his speech impediment. But through the grace of God and the help of a loving speech teacher named Margaret Lackland, I overcame that handicap and started my journey to this Hall of Fame. I accept this honor tonight with a bow to two great Chicago broadcasters, Jack Brickhouse and uh, Harry Carey. And as a tribute to these two friends, I want to close my remarks with a little verse I wrote about the classic baseball announcer. He's seen them all in action, from Charlie Graham to Reggie Jackson, from Bucky Harris to Roger Maris, from Minnie Minoso to Sammy Sosa, from Eddie Dyer to Mark McGuire. And as he narrates their parade, wondering if it's just charade, he can be vindictive or forgiving. Of all the games that he's seen played, remember now he has never paid, and he must admit that all of it beats working for a living. Thank you. God bless you. We'll be back at the Radio Hall of Fame after these messages.
now to introduce our next inductee. Tom Joyner is one of his fellow ABC Radio Network's personalities, Doug Banks. Doug was born and raised in Detroit, worked in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Las Vegas before joining WGCI in Chicago, where he did mornings until the station hired another DJ, Tom Joyner. Doug became the number one afternoon disc jockey, and the two became known as the Turntable Brothers. Right now, here he is to salute his friend Tom Joyner. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Banks. All right, perfect. You know what? I had a big speech prepared, but you know, I'm, I'm a radio guy, so I can talk off the cuff. I want to tell you something about this man, Tom Joyner. This is a man who I'm uh, very honored to call a very close friend of mine. And when this honor came up, I went to him and I said, you've got to let me do this because I'm the only one who really knows you, knows the inner workings of you. And so, of course, he immediately said, yeah, yeah, man, you're the one. And with that, I said, all right, fine. What do I tell you about Tom Joyner? Here's a man who has done an incredible thing not only for urban radio, but for radio on the whole. Tom Joyner is a very unique man. About 12 years ago, I was sitting at home doing mornings in Chicago and about to get married and was kind of anxious to be with my wife and spend time working in the afternoon. And before that happened, Tom Joyner called me one day and he said uh, there was a rumor running around that Tom was going to come back to Chicago and do radio. He was already very successful in Dallas at KKDA, and the word was out that he was coming back to Chicago to do radio. And as most radio people are, you get a little nervous when you think somebody's coming in to take your job. So he called me one afternoon and I said, hey, man, what's going on? This rumor's going on. What is happening? And he said, you want to know, man? I'm going to do them both. Both? You're going to do Dallas and Chicago? I thought six months at the outside. Well, eight years later and over nine and a half million frequent flyer miles, this man flew back and forth from Dallas to Chicago every day with two very successful shows. First, a number one morning show in Dallas, number one afternoon show in Chicago. The only reason he stopped doing it was because he had just about bought up all of American stock. And the only other reason was because the ABC radio network came to him and said, look, let's keep you in one city and put you on all over the country. To this day, the Tom Joyner Morning Show is heard in over 95 cities around America. And it's number one in many cities, Washington, D.C. It's number one in, um, in Atlanta. It's number one in New Orleans and right here in Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, enough talk. Let's hear a little bit of Tom Joyner. This is the hardest working man in radio to fly, John Tom Joyner. For that's the way he said that's the way it ought to be. And here he is, the doctor, Dr. George Wallace. Good morning, doctor. It's time for the J.O.D. I'll write the joke of the day. Joke of the day. What does Hillary Clinton, why does she look so tired, Tom? Why? So you got to get up early in the morning if you want to be the first lady. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> George Wallace. <laughs> Jay Sybil on the phone is Martin Luther King the third. Good morning. Damon Wayans on the phone. What's good up? morning? What's up, man? How you doing? It's all good. I got Reverend Jesse Jackson on the phone. Boom shakalaka. Shakalaka, shakalaka. Good, good morning. morning, family. In our DC studio is the Sugar Man. Sugar Ray Lemon. What's up, man? How you guys doing? Uh, How are you? I, I'm flabbergasted. Yes, she is. Glad. Oh, good morning, Tom. Good morning, Tom. <laughs> good morning, Gladys. You ready for the big fight? George Foreman and Larry Holmes? Two grumpy old men. <laughs> That's what they're going to call it. Two grumpy old men. Instead of stools, they're going to have rocking chairs. Yeah, lazy walk boys. They're going to have walkers take a break. <laughs> and in the fourth round, they're going to have a pee break. <laughs> <laughs> These are old men. <laughs> Time for the little known black history fact. All right. Today I'm going to tell you the story of Denmark Vesey. Born in Charleston, into mm -hmm. slavery. Paula Jones was seen leaving a cosmetic surgeon's office with her nose heavily bandaged. Either she got a nose job or she ran into Hillary over the weekend. She, she got, got a, a nine thousand dollar <laughs> Nose job. Oh, they cut her a deal. Is that expensive for a nose job? Well, when you got a nose well, like that. Oh, that's bad. Wow. Get the deposit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Sybil. Aloha. Player, player. Player, player, player. Oh, oh, oh. It's the time for the morning show. Your 
1998 inductee into the Radio Hall of Fame, truly the hardest working man in radio, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Joyner. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. This is dedicated to my mom. Hey, buddy. <laughs> buddy always said I was a big dreamer. I used to tell her stories about how I was going to be somebody. She laughed. I made, a, I made her laugh. I told her I'd be big in Chicago. Sent a picture of my name up in lights on Rush Avenue. I said, see, I'm mayor. She laughed. Buddy, no kidding. I'm in the Radio Hall of Fame. <laughs> and look who's here, buddy. Pops is sitting over there. Pops got on his same tuxedo. You can't see the moth holes. It's dark down here, buddy. But he looks good. Pops looks good. Yeah. My brother, Albert and Danita, they're sitting back there, buddy. Yeah. If, the, if, if ever there's a hamburger hall of fame, my brother will be in it. <laughs> no, he's been in the, he's been in the McDonald's uh, business for over 25 years. For a black man in McDonald's, that's pretty good. That's my brother. And he couldn't do it without my sister-in-law, Danita. And old buddy, did I introduce you to my fiance, Donna Richardson? Yeah, we're getting married. And the boys are here. My sons, buddy, your grandsons, Killer and Thriller, are sitting back there. Yeah? yeah, Killer is in charge of the foundation, buddy. Yeah, I was gonna name the, I was gonna name the foundation after you, but I decided to market the name. Uh, so I call it the Tom Joyner Foundation, and we've raised a lot of money for black colleges. Killer's the CEO. Thriller is, the, uh, is in marketing with the show. And speaking of marketing, the man who is known for Ebony and Jet and Fashion Fair, magazine, Fashion Fair Cosmetics and the fashion show for Ebony Magazine, Mr. John H. Johnson is there. He created Black Consumer Marketing. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for my break. And Marv Dyson, who's taking all the credit for me going back and forth, he's back there, even though he thought it was his idea. Yes, it was mine. Thank you, Marv. And the people who brought me to ABC are here. And here I am in front of the Hall of Fame, reaching some 95 stations with Jay and Sybil and Myra and Brad Sanders and all the people that made it possible. Buddy, they're playing the song now, so I have to go. But I'm in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> If you'd like to vote for next year's Radio Hall of Fame inductees, please call 1-800-860-9559. That's 1-800-860-9559. When we return, we'll induct a program that offers advice to the Carlorn.
Welcome back to the Radio Hall of Fame. I'm Casey Kasem. Earlier this evening, we witnessed Dick Biotti enter the portals to join the immortals. In previous years, the Hall of Fame was welcomed. Dick Clark, Yvonne Daniels, Alan Freed, Don Imus, Murray the K, Gordon McClendon, Cousin Brucey, Gary Owens, Rick Sklar, and one Kamel Eamon Kasem, Consal, slightly better known as Casey. All of us have one thing in common. We're part of Top 40 Radio, one of the most powerful formats in radio history, and one of the most fun. <clears throat> we have a proud history, but for many years we've been less than certain exactly when and how Top 40 was born. Most historians have been pinpointed two pioneers, the Texas broadcaster and Radio Hall of Famer Gordon McClendon and a Nebraskan promotional genius, Todd Storrs. Mr. Storrs, the story goes, discovered the idea of repeating the top 40 hits after an evening at a bar in Omaha across the street from his station, KOWH. He and his program director, Bill Stewart, noticed how customers kept playing the same few songs on the jukebox. This, Mr. Stewart has said, was in 1955. But... According to a new book, The Hits Just Keep On Coming, The History of Top 40 Radio, written by Ben Fong Torres, the barroom story is a myth. The book quotes Richard Fatherly, a former Soares programmer, who says that Todd Soares actually noticed the jukebox phenomenon while serving in World War II. By 1953, Mr. Soares already had a Top 40 show on his station in New Orleans called Top 40 at 1450. It was patterned after a rival stations program called the Top 20 at 1280, hosted by disc jockey Tiger Flowers. That evening in 1955, he and Bill Stewart may well have been listening to a jukebox in a bar, but by then it was nothing new. Thanks to rock and roll, disc jockeys, jingles, contests, and the promotional genius of programmers like Todd Storrs and Gordon McClendon, Top 40 was well on its way, and the hits just keep on coming. To preside over our final induction into the Radio Hall of Fame tonight, we have a broadcaster who entered the hall herself in 1996. She was the first woman to anchor a national nightly news program, and she co-hosted the award-winning national public radio news magazine, All Things Considered, from 1972 to 1986. She's the author of two books, she's a special correspondent for NPR, and she's a good friend as well as a member of the Radio Hall of Fame. Please welcome Susan Stamberg. <laughs> Now, I know there is no precedent for this, but I want to use this glamorous and extremely good-spirited occasion to resign from the Radio Hall of Fame. I was thrilled to have been inducted myself, but now you are letting in a couple of auto mechanics? I'm out of here. Fine, you can indict them. Fine, you, although that's been done, fine, you can induce them, but to induct Tom and Ray Magliazzi, those bumblers from Boston, those brothers who every week on public radio, only because commercial wouldn't have them, make Lee Iacocca choke, those guys whose choke is always worse than their bite, put the car guys in the Hall of Fame, yes, I know, it's my fault. I was the one who insisted that they be part of NPR's weekend edition on Sunday morning back in 1987. The next thing I knew, they had their own show. They had been doing car talk on WBUR in Boston for something like 10 years before I met them. Would you believe that these guys went to MIT and then they opened a fix it yourself? How cheap can you get? Auto repair shop that was called Hacker's Haven. And then one day, the program director of WBUR asked them to sit in on a panel of auto mechanics. Ray was too busy, as usual, but Tom showed up. In fact, only Tom showed up. Tom was the entire panel. And for some reason, they invited him back. This time, he dragged along his brother, Ray, who was 12 years younger, but infinitely more mature. The rest is history, a Peabody Award, a syndicated newspaper column, two books, and now this, a Hall of Fame induction, all these accolades for two little guys from Boston who sound like two guys from Boston doing some car talk. You're going to tell them where 
those plugs came from? Which cylinders? Is well, that it? Well, I'm going to suggest they came from s cylinders that are, that are symmetrically located because of the, the various amounts of cooling uh, that take place in the combustion chambers Ooh, due to the relative position of the cylinders you could in do the block. Okay, so it's not coolant leaking into the cylinders. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, you're on car talk. It, it goes like... Ah! Is, it, is it this noise? <laughs> Oh, I've got the fluttering and the raspy noise now, yes? Kind of like that. What is the fluttering? Let's do that the same thing. Do the raspy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Hello, you're on car talk. Hey, it's Jerry Lewis. Yeah, 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 Jerry Lewis. Each week on Car Talk, you'll get keen insights into the mind of the mechanic. I drove about 10 miles, and it started again. So you had 10 carefree miles. 10 ca and it was great. That's, you know what we call that in the business? The perfect repair. <laughs> car Talk. Hard questions, honest answers. Tell me, what's the expected life on this poor little thing? It, what time is it now? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, you're on Car Talk. I have a 1989 uh, 405 A 405? Uh-huh. Uh, it has, of course, in it a Bosch Motronic uh, fuel management system. Motronic. Yeah. Right, right, Motronic, that's right. Mm -hmm. They had a choice of the Curlytronic <laughs> and the Larrytronic, and they chose the Motronic. <laughs> <laughs> Join us for Car Talk from National Public Radio. When I used to smoke, a uh, cause of great concern <laughs> last week was dro dropping a cigarette down between your legs <laughs> while you were driving. Especially when you parked next to a bus. <laughs> and everyone's looking out the window, wondering what the hell you're doing. No, worse than that is driving along at 60 miles an hour. And no, it's all right if you drop the whole cigarette. you got to short it by the end. But when the end of the cigarette right fall off your legs. and fall down between your legs at 60, you're done for. And you don't think they wouldn't cause you to speak. Up. The Radio Hall of Fame is proud to induct Tom and Ray Magliazzi. Wow. You know, I didn't think I had enough plate appearances to make the Radio Hall of Fame. But my mother called me uh, just before I left the hotel and she said, do whatever you can to keep your brother from embarrassing the family. And if my watch is right, he should be getting off the train in Pensacola, Florida, right about now. However, so that you could see what he looks like, our assistant producer director has brought along a cardboard cutout of Tommy. He really doesn't have much to say very often. So this is John Bugsy Lawler. Say hi, Tommy. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say, except, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of wonderful and capable and deserving people uh, that were overlooked in order for us to receive this award. And this fellow's shaking his head. No, they weren't. <laughs> there was no one in the running against us. And we barely won at that. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, I, I do want to say a special thanks to Susan Stamberg, because without her influence, without her help, without her pulling strings and twisting arms and whatever at National Public Radio, we never would have had the show. And I'm sure there are hundreds of people at National Public Radio that to this day still will not speak to her. <laughs> but thank you very much. This is a wonderful honor. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just inducted six new members into the Radio Hall of Fame. We congratulate Bing Crosby, Dick Biondi, Ernie Harwell, Tom Joyner, Ralph Gills, and Tom and Ray Magliazzi. And we thank you for joining us tonight. Those of you here at the Radio Hall of Fame in Chicago, and those of you listening on the radio all around the country, on your next trip to Chicago, come visit us at the Radio Hall of Fame. This is Casey Kasem saying, as always, keep your feet in the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Good night, everybody. 
1998 Radio Hall of Fame induction ceremony has been brought to you by Sears. Promotional consideration provided by American Airlines and Swiss Hotel Chicago. Tonight's program was produced by Chris Broyles, written by Ben Fong Torres. The production staff was the Georgia Francis Orchestra, Dick Carter, Michelle McKenzie Voigt, Danny Roskushka, Tom Bear Cruz, Jim Guthrie, Matt Sohn, the Internet Television Network, Sam Bazanis, Art Volo, Steve Ryan, and the NBC staff. The Radio Hall of Fame broadcast is a production of the Museum of Broadcast Communications. Bruce Dumont, President. This is Jim Bohannon speaking. Good night from Chicago.